Memory management is the process of managing the memory available on a system. This is especially important on microcomputers, which may only have a few kilobytes of memory, instead of the several gigabytes your computer probably has. If memory isn't managed properly, your programs might crash, and you might lose important data that you're working with. Imagine if your document just started randomly scrambling the letters you type after you've typed them. And if your system runs out of memory, it may become unusable or unstable. Memory management is a critical job. You can think of memory management on two levels. At one level, we have the operating system, which manages how much memory each running application or process can use. This is one of the most important jobs for the OS, making sure that the memory assigned to your running web browser is not used, say, by your email client. At another level, we have memory management within Python itself. Python makes sure that any programs you have running run safely and efficiently. It makes sure that memory assigned to one variable is not simultaneously used by another. Exactly how this happens is the focus of this course. Memory is like an empty book intended for short stories. Eventually, different authors will come along and they'll write in their own stories. Since they aren't allowed to write over each other, they must be very careful about which pages they write in. These authors are like the processes writing data, or stories, into our memory book. The memory manager decides where in the book each author is allowed to write. This book is around for a really long time, so after a while, some stories are no longer relevant. From time to time, the memory manager calls in his buddy, the garbage collector, to come along and erase old stories that nobody's reading. This way, there's room in the book for new stories. Now, let's take a look at how your Python programs are actually run. This is probably not the best website to be making bold claims like this, but I'll say it anyways. Python is not that special. Really, it's not. At its core, it's just a language, and nothing else. We often think of Python as this program that we can install and use to run Python code, but that's not 100% accurate. Python is just like a reference manual that specifies all the rules of the language. Just like the English language states that every sentence should end with a period, Python states that blocks of code should be denoted by indentation, and keywords like if while, and for can be used to control the flow of execution. You can read the entire Python language specification at docs.python.org. CPython is the program that actually runs the Python code you write. It knows about all the rules of Python, so it can read your code and execute it as you'd expect. This happens when you run Python, passing in your .py file as a program argument. It should be noted that CPython and Cython are not the same thing. CPython does two things. First, it compiles your Python code down into what's called bytecode. This is basically a giant list of instructions that's hard for us humans to read, but very easy for the computer to. If you've ever seen a .pyc file or a dunderpycache file near your Python code, this is the bytecode that was generated. The bytecode is then run inside what is called the Python Virtual Machine. This is a special execution environment that reads in each line of bytecode and tells your computer how to carry out the associated operation. At the end of it all, you have a fully functioning program. The process of compiling Python code into bytecode is pretty complicated, and it's not our focus here. But, believe it or not, the C Python code that actually evaluates the bytecode in the virtual machine is pretty straightforward. It is quite literally a giant switch statement, which is like a Python conditional block. You know, if, elif, elif, and so on. Each line of bytecode, called the opcode, is read in, and then the switch block checks to see what operation should be performed. For example, no op, or load fast. It's important to note that there are other implementations of Python too. These use the same Python language specification, but they might compile and run the code a little differently. 
As a .NET developer, I really like Iron Python because it compiles Python code down to Microsoft's common language runtime instead of bytecode for the Python virtual machine. This allows me to use Microsoft technologies, like the .NET framework, with Python code. Others exist for other platforms too, but CPython is by far the most popular. CPython gets its name from the fact that it was written using the C programming language. This was done to give CPython the speed it needs to execute quickly and efficiently. All the memory management algorithms and structures exist in the CPython code, all written in C. This is a huge code base, but for this course, we just need to focus on one entity in that C code, and that is the Pi object. Pi object is the granddaddy of all objects. As you may know, every variable you create in Python, whether it be from a class you code or from a primitive type like int, is considered a Python object. That is, it is of type object. In computer memory, this object type is represented by a Pi object. A Pi object is made from a C struct, which is similar to a Python class, but with only instance attributes and no methods. The Pi object has two attributes, OB ref count and OB type. OB ref count stores how many variables are storing or referencing this object. OB type stores information about what type of object this is, whether it be int or the list, or one you create yourself by instantiating a Python class. OB ref count is used for garbage collection. Once this number reaches zero, the garbage collector knows it can free whatever memory this Pi object is occupying. It does this by looking at OB type, which stores information that tells the garbage collector how to free this memory. In this way, memory your program no longer needs is freed, and you didn't have to do a single thing. Pi object is just one example of a data structure C uses to run your Python programs. There are many others, such as C arrays, which represent Python lists. Now that you understand the basics of how C Python works, we'll take a look at what happens when memory is not properly managed. Depending on where the program is running, it could mean this. Earlier in the course, I mentioned that computer memory is like a book filled with short stories. Different processes, or authors, will come along and write stories or data into that book. And then, when a story is no longer relevant, it is erased by the garbage collector. There's only one problem. What happens if two stubborn authors come along and try to write their own separate stories on the same pages of the book at the exact same time? What happens if they both try to modify this shared resource? Chaos is what happens. Neither story will be legible because they are both writing over each other. This is where data loss can occur. To put in perspective how big of an issue this is, think about this scenario. You and your spouse share a checking account that has $1,000 in it. You go to the ATM to deposit another $1,000. While you're depositing your money, your spouse is at a different ATM attempting to withdraw $1,200 from the same account. The banking system needs to simultaneously deposit and withdraw money from the account at the same time, which is impossible. It must perform one transaction at a time. The problem is, without any safety precautions in the code, what order the transactions will occur in is fundamentally unpredictable. That decision is made by the operating system's scheduler, which gives the CPU small chunks of time to perform each computation, or in this case, transaction, when it's trying to do multiple things at once. Ideally, the $1,000 is deposited first, bringing the balance to $2,000. Then, your spouse can withdraw $1,200, and the remaining balance will be $800. But what happens if the transactions occur in the opposite order? Well, first the banking system attempts to withdraw $1,200 from an account with $1,000 in it. This will likely trigger an overdraft flag, which may cause you to pay, let's say, a $10 fee. Then, with a balance of negative $210, your $1,000 deposit goes through, bringing your balance to $790. 
That's $10 less than before, all because of the overdraft. The problem here is that two processes, or people, try to modify their shared resource at once. This is called a race condition. Due to the unpredictable nature of these bugs, they are some of the hardest to fix. Race conditions often appear in multi-threaded programs. That is, a process that spins up multiple threads of execution to try to do multiple things at once. If thread 1 tries to access data in memory just as thread 2 is freeing it, the program might crash. Here, the threads are like the authors from our book analogy. The best way to write multi-threaded programs free of race conditions is to write thread-safe code. In thread-safe code, any shared resource that could potentially be accessed by multiple threads simultaneously is protected by what's called a mutex. A mutex has the job of ensuring that only one thread has access to a shared resource at any given time. One form of a mutex is a lock, which quite literally locks the shared resource. When one thread is accessing the shared resource in memory, that resource is said to be locked. Any other thread is denied access until that thread is done with it. Once the first thread is done, it releases the lock, which can then be acquired by another thread that needs to access the resource. As you can imagine, writing thread-safe code can be hard. That's why thread-safe code is often found in low-level languages like C and C++, which are more likely to be used for multi-threaded programming due to the speed and unrestricted access to computer memory they have. Multi-threading is helpful when you're trying to write a high-performance compiler and interpreter for a language, aka CPython. After all, we expect our Python code to run as quickly and efficiently as it possibly could. CPython must also make sure any shared resources are thread-safe, or else your Python programs might start to exhibit unpredictable behavior. Understanding the basics of multi-threading and its various challenges will better allow you to understand some of the decisions that went into the development of CPython. One of the most controversial is the global interpreter lock, coming up next.